from uh, Elsa Keating today. So she's gonna talk to us about uh, distinguishing monotone Lagrangians via holomorphic analyte. Thank you very much for the, the introduction. Um, obviously, please let me know at any time if you, know, you can't hear me anymore or you know, more than Ali, if you have a question, uh, I'll try and keep an eye on the chat. Um, so, so this is about a paper that appeared on the archive at the start of the year that identifies that. So, so what's this project about? Um, well, the idea was, was sort of twofold. On the one hand, to sort of explore a range of, sort of construction techniques for monotone Lagrangians, to sort of give, give ourselves extra examples, and also to try and get, you know, theor so, you know, theoretically, you can distinguish things by counting holomorphic annuli, and I wanted to sort of have a sort of application and practice of that. So, so what's the story? Um, oops, does this work? Come on. Here we go. So, who is we're going to have compact monotone Lagrangians, including exact ones? Um, the dimensions can be arbitrary, but they're going to look like this. So, in the dimension two case, it's something like connect sums of tori and Klein bottles. In the dimension three case, I can do things like S1 times some of the above, and then you could connect some of those, um, and sort of so on iteratively. Um, in the talk today, I'll, primary, I'll focus back primarily on the N equals two case and a little bit on the N equals three case. Um, where are these arrangements being constructed? So in Stein varieties and kind of the Building blocks are just um, risk on fan hypersurfaces. So one equals X to the A plus Y to the B plus Z to the C, et cetera. Um, where A and B can be pretty small, for instance, two and four or three and three. Um, and then C and the later ones typically have to be quite big for, for these constructions to go through. Or there will also be applications, for instance, to the case of uh, Cn or C3. Um, what? Well, um, I, I'll explain how to construct infinite families of these Lagrangians where basically all of the soft invariants are fixed. Um, and uh, mu here denotes mu here denotes the uh, Maslow class and what the not only so these infinite families with fixed soft soft invariants and also you can prescribe what those invariants are um, as we'll see um, and in we'll always be able to distinguish those up to Hamiltonian isotopy and sometimes we'll also be able to distinguish them up to compactly supported simplex morphisms. Um, for n equals two and three, this will be for T2s in the n equals two case, and things that look like um, S1 times a surface of genus G uh, in the n equals three case. Um, and how these being distinguished? The sort of tools for construction are monodromy and mapping class group ideas. And the tools for distinguishing them, well, to tell things apart up to Hamiltonian isotopy, you can use just Lagrangian Fleur theory, so I put HF here. Um, and the, uh, the holomorphic annuli are going to come in to tell, to enable us to tell things apart up to symplectomorphism. Um, and as I was mentioning before, uh, this, you know, in a sense, this, you know, I didn't try in this project to take the whole of the annular ideas as far as one might try, because um, the, the sort of first goal was just to convince myself that these could be sort of powerful so invariants with like sort of like good practical implications. Um, so, preparing this talk, 
my sister asked me what I was doing, so I sent her a screenshot. Um, and she's an engineer, and she was like, well, you've left out the why. That's very convenient, isn't it? It was always great to be asked to justify your existence by your relatives in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so to answer her, I said this. So why? Um, this is actually what I put back. Um, although on a more, uh, you know, on a less facetious note, um, I think that there's value in sort of trying to broaden our toolkit in terms of just explicit examples that we can test things on. And so, so a big motivation in this project was just to sort of have a better understanding of uh, a range of examples. Okay, um, before I move to the next page, are there any questions? Okay, I guess we're good. So, so how, how do these get constructed? Um, I know some of you have heard me report on earlier versions of this uh, project, so apologies if some of this looks familiar. Um, so let's start in the two-dimensional case, and I'm going to work, at least for now, with 3-3, three, three, and then Z to the D. So this Stein variety is the total space of a leftist variation, for instance, by perturbing X on Y slightly and then projecting to the Z coordinate. Um, that describes this space M as the total space of a Lefschetz vibration, um, which is encoded by this picture here, where you have a D3 configuration of vanishing cycles. D of these blocks. Um, and what? Let me first point out the so following. So suppose I went, you know, I started here with a smooth fiber, and I go over A, B, and C, and then I skip D and I go back to A. What does that do? Well, if I start, if I start with this orange curve, I can just calculate the effect of these four Dane twists, and you can check the sort of a standard mapping class group operation that it takes it to this uh, the, to the other side, and I've kept track of orientations. On the other hand, if you started with this one, the green one, and you do the same thing, that you know it gets swapped, it goes to the other side. Um, and let me also point out while I'm at it that um, you, if you want to just swap the direction of this uh, arrow, you can do that with different, uh, with different monogamy by going over A, C twice, and then A again. So I'm now going to use this to describe for you um, well, first, just Lagrangian, Torre, and Klein bottles that are going to be um, fibered over S1s in the base of this Lefschetz vibration. So I'm going to draw a sort of S1 in the base. Um, we'll, see, we'll, we'll see an example in a second. And let's check that things match up. So I need some conventions. I'm going to call these these two uh, bottom this bottom line here these two operations are sort of my building blocks, um, and let me have a convention where I call this um, BC CC, and you can extrapolate for things like BB. So so how can I get the um the Grandin Torre? So suppose I start here with this green curve. If I go around a BB configuration, I'm going to get the same green curve with the opposite orientation. 
And then if I do it again, I go back to where I started. So this closes up and I get a T2. Maybe let me put it in green. Um, so great, that's a start. But now notice that we can do even better because of that other operation that was swapping the two sides. Um, so suppose I start here. If I go around, then the vanishing cycle, sorry, the, well, the, the Lagrangian curve on the fiber, the, this green guy, has been moved to the other side. And now I can do this again the other way and get back to where I started. And now over this point, the S1 in the base is immersed, but in the fiber, I have two disjoint S1s. So I get an embedded T2 in the total space. Um, other questions about this? Okay. Um, and so for symmetry reasons, you can convince yourself that um, this has mass of index zero, mass of class zero, sorry. Um, and now notice that um, I can definitely make it exact because I can adjust the size of this lobe and that will make enclosed symplectic area go, it go up, say. But then I could also increase the size of this lobe and that will make it go down. So if I make them even, I'll be good. Uh-huh. Did someone say something? Okay, never mind. Okay. So I have a question. How about the area of the other generator of this torus? Is it zero? The one? The fiber size one is zero because it bounds a Lagrangian symbol because it's a vanishing cycle. Uh -huh. Ah, okay. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? So, so now we have these two key ideas. The first one is that the S1 can be immersed in the base because of this BC configuration trick. And the second idea is that if I have basically lobes with two different orientations on them, I can adjust symplectic area. Um, and once I have that, you can kind of, once you have that, you can kind of run with it. Um, so here's a general example of a family of a torus. Um, so so let's uh, let's decode this a bit. For what's going on, I have this curve in the base which is immersed, and I've just wound and wound around and around. And then the colors here, let me use gray, the colors here are encoding what the curve is kind of above this branch. So it could be red, blue, or green, and I've kept track of orientation. So blue goes one way, green goes the other way. Um, as M varies, um, this is going to change the homology class. Um, changes homology class. Although on the other hand, the winding here now, if you do it two at a time, because the orientations of blue and green uh, cancel each other, this doesn't change the homology class. So, mm -hmm. um, and similarly with this one, with the Ls, and you can. Um, I, won't, I didn't write down the formula here, and I don't remember it exactly off the top of my head, but you can calculate the Maslow class. Uh, you can calculate the Maslow class of this explicitly, basically just based on the number. Uh, so let me write mu depends. Based 
on number of BC BB moves. Um, but um, hopefully it's easy to convince yourself that um, A, you're going to be able to calculate that explicitly because the configuration, because things are completely explicit. And B, you're going to be able to adjust it by sort of varying uh, M, K, and L. So increasing uh, increasing uh, K makes it go up if you pick this orientation, and increasing L makes it go down. Um, are there questions about this picture or anything else? Okay. So, um, so this is a torus. Um, if you wanted a Klein bottle, you could just skip or add an extra BB move. And then you would have something closing up where the two orientations wouldn't match, and you get a Klein bottle. Um, how about connect sums? Well, you can just take copies of this guy and kind of pull to them together. So for connect sum um, of T2s, if you want to connect sum, T2s, and Kleins. Um, take multiple copies and you do pull to revit them. So how would light look like in practice? Well, here I, inside this BB cluster, I have one or in fact two A um, critical points. Um, I can just take a sphere coming out and then kind of glue up to one in a different cluster. And then do Paul Turovich surgery at these two points. These are two transverse intersection points. Okay. So this is an idea of how to construct things in two dimensions. How about telling Tori apart? Um, well, because everything is sort of fibered, it's quite easy to calculate, for instance, ranks of topology groups, because you can sort of apply things like the open mapping principle over and over again. So in particular, you could compute flow cohomology with some reference sphere. Um, for instance, I could take a sphere, you know, starting at one of the critical points here and coming out. And um, if you calculate mass slope indices, you can see that you don't have cancellations in, you don't have, you can't have cancellations in your flow differential. So you can basically read the rank off from the picture. Um, and if you're a bit more careful, you can also calculate flow cohomology, for instance, between Lagrangians in the same uh, family. So kind of above varying the K, L and M's. And one thing that's interesting here is that this can be, or for experts, is this can be uh, arbitrarily high. Um, what do these FLIR cohomology calculations allow us to prove? Well, on the one hand, we have this theorem. So suppose I have, um, let's purple again. Suppose I have this Lagrangian, which is a connect sum of T2s and Klein bottles. I've fixed um, any class in H1 that might be a Maslow class. So, you know, even class for connect sum of T2s, um, in general, you know, there are sort of basic topological constraints that I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, and this is a bit more technical, but I want to point out that you can also just fix any monotonicity constant you want. So the monotonicity constant, remember, is the proportionality constant between um, mass loss class and symplectic area. Then for sufficiently large D, um, so D is just going to depend, D actually just depends on the topology of, of sigma.
um, I have an infinite, or in fact, tons of infinite families of homologous, as in same homology class, monotone Lagrangians with topology sigma, R, arbit R arbitrary fixed choice of Maslow class and monotone constant in, um, well, our new, uh, here I went back to x squared plus y4, you could also have cube and cube. Um, in fact, the, the one with two and four embeds into the one in three and three anyway. Um, I know this already, I guess. Um, so, okay, that's the first thing that might be useful to know. Um, I want to point out that this observation about HF between the Russians and the same family, I mean, obviously it will give you this theorem back, but also because of this thing with arbitrary rank, um, we have this other conclusion, which is that if you restrict just for a moment to the tori, to, to families of tori, um, this means that no two tori are related by what often gets called a geometric mutation. What do I mean by this? Well, for instance, in work of, um, this it started with probably work of Vienna in a closed case, and in general constructions uh, inspired by SYZ um, or sort of Gross-Siebert considerations. Um, a lot of the infinite families of tori that we know of in uh, symplectic four manifolds basically can be obtained from one another through sort of operations that are essentially mirror to wall crossing where you have a Lagrangian torus and a Lagrangian disk with boundary on that torus and then you get a new Lagrangian torus by a sort of um, mutation this operation gets called a mutation, um, which is a new Lagrangian torus. Um, so this is T and this is T prime, um, but HF of T with a local system and T prime with some other local system is either cohomology of a torus or zero. Um, or, so or, or let me say, a better way of putting it, it's cohomology torus um, for suitable choices of L and L prime. Um, this is, for people who are familiar with the story, this is what gives you um, cluster, um, cluster uh, coordinate change equations. Um, let me write that down too. But in particular, this rank can't be uh, arbitrarily large. So if the rank between the Russians is arbitrarily large, the rank of local is between the Russians is arbitrarily large, then you know for a fact that these cannot be related by geometric mutation. Um, and on the other hand, I'll also explain shortly that um, these Lagrangians can't be related sort of using the other main technique we have to get new Lagrangians from all in this dimension, which is to use, um, to like start with one and apply Dane twists or more generally some kind of symplectomorphism to them. Um, questions? Are your different monotone tori uh, Lagrangian as a topic? Um, not usually, um, I haven't, but I haven't written that up. Um, I can't see who's speaking, sorry. I'm Felix, uh, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we can come back, we can come back to that more. Um, yeah. Other questions? 
And uh, can you design a, a torus which is displaceable in this way? Um, no, because you have non-zero fluid chromology with a sphere. So they're non-zero objects of the Foucault category. Mm -hmm. so, so, so in particular, it can, cannot be displaceable from itself. No. Um, I, I guess I was coming to this question from sort of the if if you have uh, if if the homology with a sphere is not trivial, then the homology with itself has to be non-trivial. So then it cannot be disjoint. Not sure. Yeah. So so maybe something that took up by this discussion is the fact that um, because of the results of Seidel, in general for these Bridge um manifolds. The Foucault category is uh, split generated by the Grangian spheres, by the vanishing cycles. For the, um, you, can, you can think of this as a, a Milner fiber and the, the vanishing cycles of the singularity split generate the Foucault category. Um, there is a question from Chris. Hi, Chris. Oh, hi. Yeah, uh, so are, are these um, all distinct objects of the Fukaya category? Like you never get isomorphic objects? Um, well, it, it depends on exactly what, what you do, but sort of within, within one of these infinite families, yeah, you can make sure that they're all distinct. Uh, so do you, do you ever get isomorphic objects? You mean for, for well-chosen local systems or something? Yeah, something like that, yeah. Um, I never check that carefully, but I think the answer is no quite easily just by looking at fuller cohomology with a sphere. Um, because you you would get different ranks. Um, maybe maybe you need to take a couple of spheres rather than just one, depending on you know, exactly what configuration. Like you know, the, these techniques are clearly flexible, right? Like you could, once you have these sort of ideas with monogamy and adjusting areas and adjusting Nastoff class, you can kind of run with it in a range of similar looking configurations. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks. Try to pick. The only question, the, the reason I'm hesitating is you know, if you try to make D, you know, the, the power of Z as small as possible, you might not have quite have space to easily tell them apart. But if you just make it a tiny bit bigger, you can very easily tell them apart. And that's somehow, that's a technical issue rather than a, a philosophical one, I think. Okay, thanks. So uh, there is another question, uh, yeah. Elsa from, um, Ben Yuan Li. Yep. Uh, hi. hi. Uh, hi. My question hi. is uh, Are these like Lagrangians smoothly isotopic to each other? Um, I I can prove it depends on exactly how you modify things. I some of these I expect yes, but I haven't thought that I haven't it kind of ties back to Felix's question about being the Grangian isotopic. Um Basically, it, it, it depends on what you do. But if, oh, um, when you do these two windings, you know, if you increase k by one, you kind of wind one way and wind back the other way. Um, I want those to cancel. 
but somehow because you're in dimension four rather than in um, dimension six or above, I couldn't use the um, the kind of differential topology tricks that I would have wanted to use to argue that these things, that those cancelled. I don't know if this answers your question or not. I mean, it, it doesn't fully, obviously, but um, that's how much I thought about it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let me adjust this. Um, so, oops, sorry guys. Test me out for scrolling. Okay, back on track. So let's stick with Fry for a while. Um, as I've told you about distinguishing them via via sort of ranks of flow groups and that distinguishes things up to Hamilton and Um how about uh, how about uh, holomorphic annuli, which I promised to you in the first slide. Um, so let me tell you first about the easiest um, case, which is the case where um, it's monotone, but not exact. So the monotone, the uh, Maslow class is non-zero. So notice that if Maslow class is non-zero, then I can write down a sort of monotone displacement of, um, you know, if your original Lagrangian was L, some monotone displacement L prime, which just has, you know, same everything, but a different monotonicity constant. And if you're in the torus case, then because the, um, because it factors as, um, because it factors as S1 times S1, um, you can arrange for this displacement to just be disjoint. So what would that look like in practice? Um, well, here's my example from above. Um, and what, what would this mean in practice? Well, I, you know, you could take either a slightly sort of positive monotone displacement or slightly negative. And then you would imagine just kind of in the base, taking a sort of parallel S1. Um, and so on, I'll spare you the winding. Um, so this would be my L prime. Um, now, how, where were the holomorphic annuli? Notice that I can do the following. So if I look at the fiber here, I could partially compactify. I could partially compactify it like this. Um, and that's compatible with the monotomies in the picture. So putting everything together, I get some partial compactification of M, say M bar. And let me call D the sort of divisor with infinity that uh, we introduce in the process. Um, and now notice that, you know, well, just in this little 2D picture, there's a holomorphic annulus right here. Where do I see holomorphic annuli here? Well, looking above, you know, this point here, for instance, I'm going to get a holomorphic annulus where on one branch, it's going to have boundary on, you know, the blue, the blue guy, which is on L. And on the other branch, it has boundary on the uh, red guy, which is on L prime. Here's the blue guy. Um, and notice, well, in the fiber, Naively, these annuli are regular. And if you look at the base, you have a transverse intersection, so that fits well. So how, how can we try and formalize this? So I want to count, I'm seeing a mark point here. I'm going to count holomorphic maps 
from an annulus to M bar, which take, um, so here's my annulus, it's got two boundary components, del1 and del2. I want del1 to go to 1, to L, and I want del2 to go to L prime. Remember, L prime is this monitor and displacement working in a torus case, so I can think of um, L1 disjoint union, sorry, L disjoint union L prime as um, a Lagrangian link where each component is monotone, albeit with different monotonous constants. Uh, my mox point uh, goes to D, um, and I guess I didn't write down the homology, um, the homology condition, but you'd want the class of U to be in the same class as the ones I wrote on the previous slide. Um, or in fact, more generally, There are, uh -huh. um, if you go back, if you go back here, you have two kinds of annuli. You have the ones that are sort of blue meets red and the ones that are green meets red, where blue and green have different orientations. And what I write is the alpha prime where I'm using natural isomorphism between homology of L and L prime, you know, induced by the displacement. Um, okay, so uh, moduli space, um, you know, from, I guess, going back to Melissa's thesis, let me check that this has expected dimension zero, um, so the Maslow class zero and annuli have order characteristic zero. Um, the examples above, uh, as on the previous slide, are regular because um, they're sort of regular in the fiber and you have you know, transverse branches in the base. So you can sort of linearize your, you can kind of linearize your equation completely by hand and convince yourself quite quickly that this is regular. But of course, the question is that the bigger question is well, great, you have this count for this J. But why is this an invariant? So what do we need to have an invariant? Well, or rather what, what can go wrong? The first thing we need to worry about is the boundary of the abstract moduli space of annuli. So, so I don't know um, how familiar this is, but the the moduli space of annuli, you kind of have um, sort of goes from zero, to, let me say, zero to infinity, um, where the parameter is um, the modulus, which is um, roughly speaking, sort of the conformal radius of the annulus. So at this end, you get pinching, but I can't have, I can rule this out because L1, L and L prime just destroy. On the other hand, the modulus infinity, that means that one boundary component has shrunk to a point. So that's what what's the signal. But I can also rule this out because the class of alpha is non zero in H1 of L or L. Same with alpha prime. So it can't have shrunk down to a point. So, and in fact, the reason that I work with this monotone displacement is to buy myself out of this problem. Um, what's the other thing I need to worry about? Well, what kind of bubbling can happen? Um, so there's basically two different possibilities. I mean, disc bubbling, um, but either the marked point can be bubbled off in a disc or the, a, a disc falls off um, and the marked point stays on the annulus. Um, I guess I'm gonna, you know, this is uh, somewhat sketchy, but um, feel free to, ask me for details now or later. 
So, so let's look at the left-hand side first. Um, this disk here that's bubbled off goes through the divisor in infinity, and it has that intersection has multiplicity one. So, you know, there's a standard argument which shows you that that's simple. And so this, this disk here has to be regular. So it's, well, for, for generic J, this disk will be regular. So it, so by looking at the expected dimension of such a space, see that the Maslow class for, or Maslow index for beta or minus beta are very positive. Uh, and in fact, you, you can do slightly stronger than that, but I'll let me leave it like this because this argument, basically the, let me put it this way, there's enough leeway in the n equals two um, moduli space calculations that they also carry through for n equals three. And what I've written here applies to either. Um, but now we're basically in business because alpha here has mass of zero. Um, but now this annulus overall has negative or at least non-positive mass law class, but it has positive symplectic area because it's holomorphic. Um, and you can imagine just capping off this guy with a Lagrangian disk, um, which would give you something that still has positive symplectic area overall, but it has boundary on a monotone, you know, L or the way I've written things, it would be L prime. Um, so contradictory. And on this side, you can run basically a similar but even simpler argument because um, you know, this would also be simple. And then you run a similar argument, but then it's even quicker because you get something here which has a negative mass off index and you know it's a holomorphic disk with boundary on a monotone Lagrange. So Elsa, there was a question from Denis. Ah, I'm sorry. Hi, Denis. Hello. Sorry, I'm not in a good place to speak. But um, anyway, the, yeah, the question was whether both boundaries are known to be not null homologous, so that they, neither of them can shrink. Yes, because because I want I want these to be equal. I want these to be equal under the natural identification. I, um, one, um, it's, it's, um, it's slightly annoying because I do this thing where I put multiple copies of the same slide with extra things, but then when I move to kind of the next iteration within the slide, I lose the annotations. I just keep the annotation the fact that these should match up under this isomorphism. So they're both non-zero because in fact, they're sort of the same, morally speaking, the same class, if that makes sense. So. There is another question from uh, Marco Castronovo about uh, whether the annulus can degenerate to a pinched annulus, which would mean a flower strip, basically. Um, um, I, think, I think the pinched annulus you're thinking of is this. Is this what you mean by pinched annulus, Marco? This is what uh, I would. So I, I had two, actually, two more degenerations in mind. One were, were uh, can, can you go back to the last slide? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, the last, the last one, uh, the last. Yes. Uh, so uh, one. This is, this is bubbling. Yeah. yeah. So okay. in the bubbling. Uh, okay. So one where you there is an arc that connects. Two different boundary components that uh, degenerate, uh, but but that I guess is excluded because the two Lagrangians are disjoint. Mm -hmm. and, and another one where you collapse uh, some, some waste, uh, but yeah. 
And anyway. Yeah. Um, but no, that that that's ruled out too. Um, because because that would be the same as a bubble and a boundary and this this behavior that is ruled out. Or, or it happens in lower co-dimension. I can't quite tell exactly based on your description what kind of issue you have in mind, um, but I'm happy to uh, go through pictures at the end for as long as you want. Uh, Elsa, I think Marco means a pair of disks, like uh, two disks meeting at one interior point. Right. Yes, that was one of the two degenerations. Yes. This one? Right. Yes. yes, I think he means a pair of disks, as in the other end of the open closed map degeneration arguments. Two disks. Yeah. Yes. And yes. so if the boundary loops are not zero in each one of the ambient space, then that's probably a dimension argument rather than an yeah. impossibility. Right. Yeah, or, or you could use, you could use, I mean, I guess, but you can rule this. You can rule this out a couple of different ways, even I think, because um, because this is going to lie inside your M that's monotone, and you have a monotone, uh, and your Lagrangian is monotone, and mass loss of the boundary is zero. Um, so this actually has to be constant, and then you're in trouble. Oh, okay. so there's a bunch of there's a bunch of different ways to, of getting to it. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, um, and uh, sorry, it's been a very long day. Uh, right, here I am. Um, the hopefully, if you're at least if you're if bubbling is something you used to thinking about, um, you could see that to rule out this sort of second kind of bubbling, um, I can follow a, a, a similar and indeed slightly simpler argument than the one I had for the left-hand side. Um, at this point, uh, I'm not quite done for holomorphic annuli, even in uh, this dimension, because remember this uh, story was premised on having something that was monotone but not exact, so that I could pick an, uh, a sort of monotone, so the head sort of a preferred direction in which to displace it and to get a monotone displacement. So, oh, this is helpful. Um, so, for the monotone exact case, sorry, they're saying there's no monotone displacement. Um, so all I want to say today is a sort of, you need to be more careful, um, but actually you can still, uh, you can still rule things out using topological arguments to sort of an extra page and a half's worth of them. Um, it's not particularly deep, but it kind of, um, uh, I thought that uh, there were enough uh, there was enough at, at this point about bubbling in the talk that um, I would maybe uh, spare you those details. Um, okay, so now we have uh, the we have holomorphic annuli as invariance to uh, as invariance of these uh, at least some of some of the Lagrangians I've constructed. And of course, the the annulus the, the annular count is an invariant just of L, my Lagrangian torus, um, which means that uh, if I change L by compact isobotism ectomorphism, then the count is going to be unchanged. Um, I need the simple ectomorphism to be compact, or at least kind of compact in half of the directions they were, because 
I rely on this partial compactification of my Stein manifold M. Um, okay, so, so that's the or part of the uh, two-dimensional story. What happens in dimension three? So first of all, let me do a bit of an aside. I don't know if you remember on the first slide, I said that there were some things, or maybe not that many, that I can say about the Rangians in CN, um, which is maybe interesting for different reasons. So what can we do with our uh, you know, two-dimensional Lagrangians? So um, let's, I can take the map from C3 to C, given by just the defining polynomial for my Stein variety M. So you know, x4 plus y squared plus z to the d. Um, there's a critical point here. And then there's, I could pick a smooth point, a smooth value. The fiber above this is going to be M. And then I have, you know, my Lagrangian sigma inside M, and I can just do sigma times S1 by taking some S1 in the base. And if I pick this to uh, enclose the right area, so this can, I can pick any area, um, I get a monotone S1 times sigma, in C3. Um, and of course, these are displaceable. Um, the, uh, I want to point out that when the genus, uh, let me just do the uh, orientable case, so say uh, sigma is a surface of genus G. I want to point out that when the genus is two or more, um, I can tell, we or one can tell these apart a bit just using soft invariants. Um, of course, for genus one, um, there's a, a, a well-known paper of Denis, which uh, gives an infinite family of Lagrangian T3s in C3 um, by counting holomorphic disks rather than uh, holomorphic, well, rather than annuli, for instance. So, what's the theorem? So, there's infinitely many monotone Lagrangian S1 times surface of genus G, um, and distinct up to well, we're going to be distinguishing them using soft invariants. So actually, you can have distinct up to something as loose as Lagrangian isotopy, or indeed any symplectic morphism. Um, how do you tell them apart? Well, the key is just the Maslow class um, of the surface of genus G, and then use the fact that um, the diffeomorphism group of the three manifold S1 times surface of genus G, if G is greater than two, um, basically splits. And this goes back to the work of Waldhausen. Um, but this means that even though this S1 here in the base always has mu equals two, um, if you had sigma in M, um, where you know the minimal Maslow number, say mu sigma, is to capital N, um, then you know this is an invariant, um, and you can tell Lagrangians apart that way. Um, I don't know how to tell them apart. You know, if you fix the soft invariants, I don't know how to tell them apart using. Uh, using uh, counts of holomorphic curves. Um, but you know, given how little we know about Euclidean space, it seemed worth pointing this out anyway. Um, are there questions?
Uh, I can't remember what I tried. Well, you probably didn't try, but did you try uh, displacement energies? Because when you have disks, then displacement energy information is usually equivalent. So I would wonder whether your cylindrical, your NLI invariance could be compared to displacement energy. In these vibration pictures, they are very oftentimes easy, easily computable. I, I would actually think these all have, we can talk about that again. I think that those should, that you shouldn't be able to tell them apart that way actually, but um, uh -huh. I'm happy to talk about it more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, are there other questions? Okay. Um, so, so in the final minutes, I want to, and this is sort of um, directed more at experts, I want to try and give you just an idea of um, what goes on in higher dimensions. Um, oh. Except my computer's frozen. Here we go. So, so in general, so let me just do dimension three. I could start with this three manifold, you know, x cubed, y cubed, z to the r, that's the same as before, and then I add a w to the s. And I can equip this with a Lefschetz vibration where the fiber is going to be my previous guy, M. Remember that M was this equal to one. Um, by projecting to some small deformation in X, Y, Z plus W. And the Lagrangians in higher dimension. Hello? Hello? Um, someone's not muted who's, is, am I the only person who can hear? I can you're good. You're, we, we heard you all the time. Okay. Um, so, so remember before we had the trick that we used those um, sort of BC and BB blocks um, in order to uh, build a Lagrangian that was uh, embedded in the total space, even though it was immersed on the base. And now it's sort of the same idea iteratively. So I have this immersed S1 in the base of this left switch vibration. And I put, you know, my, I've been calling this, so this, this would be, you know, my connect sum of T2s and clines. And I want to move around in some cunning way in the base so that I bring this Lagrangian, which is inside M, back to itself. Um, and there's a, there's a way of, um, the way I do this is as follows. So, So now I've gone one dimension down. So I have M, my fiber, and uh, I'm looking at the left variation M given by small perturbation X and Y plus Z. And assume that R is in fact uh, a composite number, so K times D, so for sufficiently large K and D. The polymorphism of M, this row, Um, which can be described in two different ways. So on the one hand, I can imagine, so the, this left shift vibration is kind of periodic. It's got a, a sort of Z mod R symmetry. And so this is kind of picking up this base of M, rotating it by two pi over K and kind of pushing it back down. And that, as long as you've picked K and D large enough, that actually um, lifts to 
a well-defined automorphism of M. Um, this is non-trivial, but it builds on kind of uh, various things that Paul Sadell has observed about uh, monodromy for this kind of uh, for this kind of uh, hypersurface singularity. Um, so, on the one hand, the sort of so rho on the one hand is induced by um, rotation of base, uh, let me call this pi. Um, but the other, on the other hand, if I call this singularity f, um, you can check, and this is, well, maybe not a theorem, but at least a proposition in the paper, that rho is also given by some power of the monodromy of f. Um, in particular, can be given by a product of positive exists. And once you have this expression as a, uh, in terms of positive being twists, you can use that for the, uh, in order to kind of muck around like you want in here, because as you're doing monodromy around here, what is this where you're doing um, some power of the monodromy of M? of monodromy of f. Um, and now, how do we get, well, for instance, annuli counts? Well, imagine you have a Lagrangian here. You pick up, um, I guess you can't see, you pick up and you lift it around to get this one here. Oops. Sorry. This one here. And then the only place where these Lagrangians overlap is basically in here. And then in here, you can arrange for the projections of the bits of the two Lagrangians to look, for instance, like this, and um, where they, they don't intersect um, but you still get the holomorphic cannuli count um, from basically these points here. Um, and uh, I shouldn't have switched to sign, I apologize, um, but uh, yes, I'm out of time and uh, for better or worse, this is the final slide. Um, so uh, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy your sunny afternoons. Um, I thought it was fun to look at everyone's weather. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Elsa. Thanks a lot. <laughs> so yes, we have all the weather in. Uh, Indeed, yeah. Yes. Um, I took I took the screenshots at different times um, because. Uh, this was a bit of a whim. Uh, it was not central preparation to the talk. Good. good. So uh, let's see if there are some more questions. Yeah. Let me let me put this a bit. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, so I maybe I, I can I have a very stupid question. I I missed. So where did you use count of holomorphic annuli in your story? Um, counts of holomorphic annuli allow me to tell Lagrangians apart up to uh, symplectomorphism. Because if you're just using, Fleur, if you're just comparing things by doing Fleur cohomology, for instance, with a fixed reference Lagrangian, then, you know, it could just, you know, naively, it could just be that in disguise, this you know, infinite family of tori, for instance, was maybe just one torus plus a bunch of its images under some interesting uh, collection of Dane twists. Um, so I thought it would 
be interesting to see, in particular, just, just thinking about Tori, which I know is what many people are sort of most interested in. Um, I thought it was worth trying to get families where you know that they're neither related by simplex morphisms, in particular the ones that we know, Dane twists, nor are they related by um, the sort of mutation, um, sort of the mutation operations, which is basically the other technique we have for um, for, for sort of generating infinite families of Lagrangians of Lagrangian tori, loosely speaking. And so, what what is the precise statement about annuli? So, uh, uh, so it's invariant of what? I, I, so, uh, you count annuli between pair of tori, right? Um. No, the annulus. So the annuli count. Um, maybe I'll just box it here. The annuli count. Is an invariant of one torus um, because I count uh, I count annuli with boundary on L and L prime, but L prime is completely determined by L. Okay, thank you. So I, I obtain a link, but okay. kind of intrinsically from L. I hope that makes sense. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So, um, okay, there is, um, I wanted to make just uh, the, uh, remark a bit, then there are two other questions after that. Uh, my remark is that, uh, in fact, um, you probably know, in fact, but uh, the, this type of annulae has have been considered, uh, I think, in, uh, you know, old, old times. Uh, mm -hmm. I think they appear, you know, in early versions of the open, closed, closed open map, and uh, in particular in some of the old work I did with uh, Biran. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a time, but uh, that's where my question comes. We had uh, quite an issue to deal with regularity for Anulai. Mm -hmm. uh, because there was no, you know, we used to, to solve regularity by reducing curves to simple curves by mm -hmm. decomposition. And uh, for annulae, this, this didn't quite work like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, of course, in the meanwhile, there are other methods to deal with things uh, by adding mark points and perturbations and so such. But I was curious what you do. Uh, maybe you said, but I didn't quite follow or? Uh... Yeah, so. Um... So the so basically, is this a homogeneous equation or is it a, a non-homogeneous equation and you have some perturbations inside? So, so I think so. So I agree that in general there are sort of serious analytical difficulties to worry about, but. And hence the point of this setting is that I get to bypass them. And in particular, the annuli that I'm counting um, just um, go through uh, this divisor at infinity um, with count one. And okay, that is, right. I understand. Yeah. Okay, so this, this, this also is a technique. So if the technique is you, you ensure that it's in ba basically it's a simple object. And then, then yeah. you Right, so yeah. the, great. Um, the, the other thing is that I think there was a discussion about the various types of possible degenerations. And mm -hmm. uh, I, if I understand correctly, when you count, your Lagrangians are disjoint, right? Yes, so, which is why I can only do it with tori, because of course, if you have a surface of genus G, you can't hope to push it off itself in its own cotangent bundle. Right, so be, because I, again, from my, uh, what, what I recall from this, I, so we had this paper around 2008, or, but, but maybe it appeared much later, I think it appeared in something like uh, Yasha Fest. 
in any case, so okay. we had this uh, issue that sometimes uh, the Lagrangians can intersect, and then you do have this degeneration that somebody raised here. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Where, um, where in fact, you, you, you get to this uh, uh, annuli that, uh, you know, one uh, segment kind of collapses to an intersection. Yeah. And are yeah. connecting the two boundaries. Right, and you have like a floor strip that goes from uh, an intersection point back to itself. And there are some interesting calculations to do in that case. It's kind of a, a way to see floor theory showing up in, mm -hmm. in, indirectly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so... So this phenomenon, so, the, so very naively, the um let me, let me have a new page very nice so so you can imagine maybe i'll kind of recap a bit what you were saying at the same time for other people you can imagine having this annulus and it's traveling in time through through and it gets here yeah then you can imagine continuing life as a disc so the um the Correct. So, the, uh, so, the, so the dimension, um, let, let me say a couple of things which will hopefully be relevant um, and also help situate other people. So the dimension, naively the uh, dimension where we have the best chance of somehow still extracting valid invariance from this is in dimension three, because um, in the, the um, because uh, in this case, at least you have the sort of correct expected dimensions. Um, and then the, I think the work that is most relevant for this is sort of work of Eckholman collaborators um, who sort of thought quite hard about basically trying to equip these different holomorphic curves with sort of sufficient amounts of extra decorations that you can still make uh, sense, that you can still kind of extract some meaningful invariant, uh, even though you are not ruling out this kind of behavior. Um, this is, um, there's a, there's a couple of papers of Tobias that have um, some things and some, some uh, arguments of rolling counts of holomorphic anyway. And I think there's also, he has sort of an, uh, an informal note that he shared with me a while ago, and I'm sure that he'd be prepared to share with other people if you wrote to him. So, so uh, from what I remember, we, we were getting some sort of an Euler characteristic, uh, which is defined somehow when when floor homology of two Lagrangians is not well defined, but they are both monotone, but with some difference in uh, constants of monotonicity or something, and uh, not uh, not constants of monotonicity, the number of muscle of two disks was different, and so the floor homology was not, uh, uh, the disk square was not zero, but in any case, there are some calculations to do, but I think they are not in your case, so uh, it's just... Uh, so so in one thing that I would have uh, gone into if I had more time is the fact that for all of these Lagrangians that I write down, even the ones that have Maslow index two, you have no uh, there's no holomorphic disks, um, which sort of follows quite easily from sort of okay. open mapping theorem and sort of topological considerations. Right. Um, and in general with things that are hyperbolic, you sort of don't expect to have, um, to get interesting information from discounts anyway. Um, oh, uh, Mikalkin, you have a question? Uh, yeah, but, but uh, you, you, if, if you're finished with the previous question, yes. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, uh, 
my question is um, actually I was just wondering you had very nice uh, pictures of those story uh, mm -hmm. can you uh, maybe draw the or at yeah. least indicate how those holomorphic um, annulae look like in those pictures so yeah can we yeah yeah yeah. Them there? yeah sorry I did that too quickly mm -hmm. um, here yes so so above each of these points remember so let me remind you of this picture. Um, gray is my like parallel copy, so my L prime. Um, and it's just running sort of in the cone tangent bundle to L, just you know, parallel pushed off. And where do I have annuli? Well, I have one above this point, and I have one above this point. Um, and in general, you'd have you know k or whatever annuli, or, or you'd, you'd have so the annuli, each annulus is going to live in one fiber of this Lepsius vibration, and then it's going to look um, like this ah, picture. Yeah. I see. So, so it's part part of the fiber. So this is kind of part yeah. of a yeah, yeah, yeah. curve which gives yeah. the uh -huh. okay. Yeah, and that's and clearly I didn't explain that well enough and the um i don't know if you remember i was talking about the fact that the two branches here in the base were transverse mm -hmm. that's important to get regularity of this annulus because it basically the annulus looks like a product locally and then you can get regularity by quote unquote by hand mm -hmm. thanks very much hey yeah, you're welcome so elsa there was also a question from um philip yeah um so he, I don't know if he's still on and he can ask Yeah, I, I'm here, I'm here. Yeah. So uh, can, can we use this modular space of annually to get some nice estimate between gromo, relative gromo width of L and L prime? Um, I... Um, L prime is sort of completely accessory. Maybe I don't understand your question properly. L prime is sort of completely accessory to the story. L prime is sort of a shadow of L because you could make that displacement of L of itself infinitesimally small. Um, there's, you know, um, Maybe this loops back to Leonid's question. You know, one thing that you can check is that any two mm. any two disjoint displacements with the same monotonicity constant, or at least sufficiently small monotonicity, sufficiently small displacement, uh, you can interpolate from one to the other while remaining disjoint. Um, that just boils down to checking something about you know one forms on on an on a torus. Um, but but L prime doesn't make sense as a standalone Lagrangian. Um, this is a this is a this sort of link push off is a trick to um, to avoid the boundary of the moduli space of annuli, which you know you know which is sort of where invariants go to die in general for annuli. Okay, thanks. So there is also a question from Renato. So yep. Hi, Renato. No, um, mine was not a question. I was uh, trying to answer him in a different fashion. Uh, and that's like okay. the area of these, these, these annuli depends on what height you partially compactify your, uh, your yes, thing. So that's that, that there's no intrinsic meaning to, to, to yes. that that would help. Yes, that's also true. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks a lot. Sorry, you actually compactify what? I didn't understand that. Well, yeah. but if it means that when you take the cylinders, you have to decide what, you know, like what's the size of the... Yes. Of the so in practice, 
how the argument goes is you say, suppose I have a compactly supported symplectomorphism that takes one torus to the other, you want a contradiction. Mm -hmm. So you compactify your space outside of the support of your hypothetical compactly supported symplectomorphism. Then you show that you have this invariant. Therefore, contradiction, one Lagrangian could not have been taken to the other. But the compactification, you could be, what? You could, you know, in general, what, you know, what these Stein varieties kind of look like is you have these, you know, this gets really big at infinity, right? And you could have it be really big before putting it back, but it's not, that's not going to matter. I feel like maybe this was more confusing than helpful. Um, can I help in any way? So you mean compactification of symplectic manifold? Yes. But uh, do we really need to compactify geometrically like when I don't know, just say that some curves do not go out? Uh, um, I, I liked, so what I did is I sort of uh, locally trivialized the left shed's vibration so as that I could actually compactify geometrically. Um, that was convenient because then you have these curves that go through that sort of divisor at infinity precisely once and you get um, from simply you get simplicity and regularity from that setup um, those I, um, I'm sure that you can set it up a different way um, this allowed me to use analysis that was sort of off the shelf All right, um, so let's see if there are any more uh, questions. Um, Maybe I have another question. If, if uh -huh. you want. So, yeah, go for it. So, so assume now the following thing. So you take your Lagrangian submanifold and you deform it, but not in the direction of the Markov class. Yes. But, yes. In, but in any direction. Mm -hmm. So then in principle, you can also try to initiate the count of annually. Yeah. Try, trying to get abstractions for such deformation. So there were uh, at least two groups of authors uh, wrote papers uh, on this. So I think Anthony Membres Ganor and uh, uh, Vianne Shulukin and uh, Tonkanov. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, but I'm not sure they really used, used annually. I don't, this I don't remember. But this seems okay. to be kind of natural tool for studying deformation of uh, Lagrangian submanifolds uh, so that the flux somehow deforms. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so can you comment about this? So what is known? Um, I don't know what's known in general. You're absolutely right that I'm sort of deforming by a small amount of flux. Um, I, I guess all I have to say, I, 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 I kind of like this perspective. You're sort of, um, I guess you're sort of turning things on its head a bit. Like I, um, I picked a specific deformation in order to kind of have access to the whole thing. And you're saying, well, how about we look at all of them and kind of turn the, the question on its head a bit. Um, I, I like that perspective, but I don't, um, I don't have anything particularly insightful to say about the, these particular mm -hmm. examples. I mean, obviously, you could calculate the relevant, um, you could like, you know, they're explicit examples, so you can calculate anything you want. But um, I don't, I haven't thought about any general theory. I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, 
but, but excuse me, maybe I have, have one more question. But do you expect that this, uh, so, so according to Leonid's um, remark, do you expect this, uh, that the deformation, like where we deform the Lagrangian would, would affect the count of holomorphic annually? It's not just a technical thing, but it actually affects the answer? Um, I think you lose monotonicity if you deform different. You're going to lose true. monotonicity. So, so, so the answer is yes. Basically, the answer is sort of yes and no, depending on exactly how you phrase that question. Um, I think it was Renato who was saying you lose monotonicity. That's true. Although, of course, I, so I also, I did this thing where I swept under the rug the exact case where the deformation you choose isn't monotone in the first place. And what I do for that is I actually say, I'm going to look over all possible deformations at what possible counts are, and I get an invariant that way. Um, and if you cast it as, you know, counting over all possible deformations, you still get to tell everyone apart. But are there examples when different deformations lead to different count of holomorphic annulli? Um, so, so I think that if you deform in the direction of symplectic form. Yes, so, exactly. Yes, so, so, so I mean it will be exact. I, I, mean, I mean that if you deform in an exact way, so then areas will be zero, right? So then you will yeah. have... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, okay. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see if anybody wants to ask some more or other comments or remarks. Um, I actually don't see uh, anything else. So Elsa, you can cut your uh, screen share. Okay. Um, I think uh, we are slowly going to say goodbye, the way it looks. Of course, people can still ask catch the last moment. Um, so thank you very much again for your talk. It, uh, and, um, if Felix is still there, 